we're going to bring two people on stage who are going to give us um, insight, personal insights into why Silicon Valley would want to take its know-how and its money and bring it to Berlin, of all places. Um, and I think you'll be f fascinated by their story. So there are two young gentlemen I'd like to call up on the stage. Guys, if you guys would come up. Um, Tom, see, they've got great sound effects here, don't they? <laughs> it's wonderful. It's good. Okay, so t to my left here is Tom Preston Werner, is that correct? That's correct. And Scott Chacon, right? Yep. Now, how many people are familiar with them just by their names? Does it ring a bell with anybody? <laughs> okay, I good. I see a few. Oh, I see some hands. Okay, so you guys were the founders of GitHub. You're the co-founders of Chatterbug. And does anyone know what happened to GitHub last week? It was sold to Microsoft for several billion US dollars, billion, so it's a Deutsch Milliarden. <laughs> so we have two men who are very young, who are now at least multimillionaires, if not billionaires. So congratulations. Thank you. I'm sure everyone here hates you. I'm not just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, but l let's talk a little bit about uh, how you got from GitHub to, to Chatterbug. Who wants to take a shot at that? Sure, yeah. So my last years at GitHub, I lived in Paris um, doing things for, for, for GitHub in Paris. And I tried to learn French um, as an adult um, for the first time uh, at the age of, I don't know, 35 or 36. And it was quite difficult to do. And, and so I tried everything in the world. I tried uh, apps. I tried in-person tutors. I, I tried uh, online tutors and Alliance Francaise and like, in-person language school. Um, and, and I had to stitch a whole bunch of different things together, and it was really quite, quite difficult. There was a lot of overhead. And, and so I became passionate about this. Um, I think GitHub was on a, a path, obviously, to, to great success, which, which you know, has been sort of culminated last week with the, the Microsoft acquisition, um, and, and thought it would be interesting to do something new, something interesting, something that I wanted to see in the world that didn't exist, which is how GitHub started, right? Uh, Tom wanted to see something in the world that didn't exist and had this idea and, and brought me and a couple other people on board to, to help do that and felt it was, it was time to do something new. When, when you guys started GitHub, did you have the goal of one day selling it you know, and making a lot of money? I mean, we, we hear that story time and time again of entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. Was that the goal? That was never my goal, really. GitHub came from a place of wanting to build a tool that we could use ourselves. Right? Git brought this really new model of easy branching and merging to software, which was kind of unavailable at the time. And so we were just playing with it. You know, I thought, let's build this. I want it. I know that some of our friends want it. Maybe if we make it good enough, people will pay for it. And then we can kind of quit our day jobs and start working on GitHub full time. Yeah. And then just keep working on it and see what happens. OK. Yeah. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on GitHub because I want to talk about Chatterbug and, and, and its connection to Germany. But I, I do want to ask you, in terms of selling to Microsoft, was that something that happened? Was it easy? And did or was there a lot of courting on the part of Microsoft to get you guys to to buy or well no no I, so so we neither of us were personally involved in in the transaction we'd both been gone for a couple of years and, and we're working on the new passion that we have um, but github has been a partner with Microsoft for a long time I think I think a lot of question that I get from a lot of friends and, and people that I've known is is if they think Microsoft is, is bad for GitHub or, or, you know, or if it's going to change what GitHub is. Um, and, and GitHub had been working with Microsoft for years. They were a great partner. They worked with open source projects with us, with both of our engineers working on the same projects that, that in the case of, say, libgit2, is probably used by every competitor that GitHub has as well as GitHub, right? And so yeah. that, th those libraries are jointly, has been jointly developed by Microsoft and, and GitHub for years, or Atom with the Electron um, uh, editor. 
has been worked on by Microsoft and GitHub for years, and so it just seemed like uh, it's been a good fit for a long time, I think. So, so I'm optimistic about it. I'm happy about it. I think it's a good place for GitHub to land, and I think GitHub will be better for it in the end. Yeah, today's Microsoft is very different under Nadella than it was, yeah. say, five, ten years ago. Yeah. It's changed completely. They are one of the largest contributors to open source on GitHub. They've been involved, like Scott said, for many, many years. And they're just, they're really friendly to developers. More friendly than any other company that I can think of. They really, they care about developers, and not just their own developers, not just Microsoft developers, but they really care about the broader ecosystem now. I think they've realized that that is the best way to go. It's like it's profitable for them. And it, do you think that is, is that surprising that Microsoft is that that friendly or that open? If you'd asked me 10 years ago, yeah, yeah. when we started GitHub, I would've, it, it would have been, it would have been hard for me to believe, yes. Yeah, I, I think it was surprising when we started working with Microsoft on the, on the LibGit2 or the Electron projects, to, to me personally, because um, of, uh, you know, I grew up doing Linux in, in college, like a nerd, um, and, and writing all my, my papers in LaTeX and, and stuff. So that, that was the world that I came from. I didn't like Microsoft at the time. Um, working with them at GitHub, though, it really changed my perception of the company and, and what is important to them and how they operate. So, okay. Um, even even taking personal finances out of it, I'm I'm I, I am glad that that's where GitHub ended up. And, and they've really they selected a really great CEO. To yeah, bring, Nat, I Nat think is fantastic. Nat Friedman, he was the, the he created the Xamarin project. He he lives and breathes open source every day. Like this is his heritage. So I think it's a really smart play from Microsoft to have him be the the new CEO. And and what about uh, let's talk a little bit about Chatterbug and it is. It was your decision to come to Berlin to make this company happen, right? And why? Right. Well, so it started because I didn't speak any German at the beginning of the project, and I spoke a little bit of a, a, a number of other languages, and I wanted to compare if I had done a, a, an idea that I had of, of this sort of holistic language learning process where I'm learning with flashcards in a spaced repetition style and it's relatively efficient and then I can practice that with a one-on-one -on -one tutor and it's not group classes, um, which that's the core of, of what we're doing. Um, I wanted to compare it. it. Can I learn German faster than I learned French with, with the other methods that I had tried to learn French? So I could have sort of an apples to apples comparison. Um, I would have done Japanese or, or Mandarin or something, but there's different writing systems and the, it complicates the comparison. So um, since I didn't know any German, I could start from zero. Um, what, why did you want to know German? What's that? Why did you want to learn German? Um, it was, uh, it's an interesting language. It was something that I didn't know anything about. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I, I'm glad that I've, I've learned it now. But that's why we came to Berlin originally, is because that was the language that we had curriculum for. It was the first one we started doing. Um, and then we came here, and, and we got here, and, and Berlin specifically is, is less expensive than, than San Francisco, where we come from. So every hire we make, it makes much more sense, I think, to hire in Berlin than it does in San Francisco. Um, we got good at running distributed teams at GitHub. GitHub is a highly distributed organization. And so us being in San Francisco most of the time and, and going back and forth and having a distributed team was not complicated. So we can hire people in other cities. And, and, um, and, and there's a huge international global talent pool in Berlin by itself. There's tons of, of expats in the city, and so we can pull from people from all over the world. And Do, what, what kind of talent pool are you, are you talking about? Are, you, are expats, so you mean native English speakers? Uh, no, only about, what, not even half the company are, are probably native English speakers. Yeah. Um, we have probably 15 or 20 languages that are spoken collectively by, by all of the employees, the, the 20 employees in the company. Um, maybe more. I don't yeah, I actually know. Yeah, it's 20 right now. Um, and, and, but yeah, it's mostly curriculum developers writing the curriculum for, for our app, business, um, a couple of engineers. Um, but yeah, we pull people from countries all over the world because they, they all live in Berlin. And, and they're cheaper than they would be in Silicon Valley. Yeah, well, yeah not just salaries, but office space. Um, but how, how much cheaper? That's probably half, I think, on general. Yeah, at the end of the day. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's, a, big, that's yeah, a big money, difference. Imagine we, your money going twice as far. Like, it's a really, in, in a seed stage, in the early stage of a startup, this is no small matter, right? That means that you can raise less money, you can try out ideas that you wouldn't be able to try out maybe in Silicon Valley where you need to pay people so much more. I think you can be more exploratory here. What about venture capital to start this company? 
you were telling me that you actually got it from Germany. Yeah, so we each put in some of our own money, and, and then uh, we raised some money from a company here, a VC firm in Berlin called Fly Ventures. Fly Ventures, They've yeah. been really amazing. So that's where the, the bulk of our external money came from, as well as uh, SV Angel in San Francisco, which yeah. we raised from, from GitHub as I well. Mean, I mean, I think that that's a big point, too, because we hear time and time again that Germany is a risk-averse culture, um, capital or venture capital is very anemic here, and but you you guys say you didn't find it to be that way. Yeah, I think I think I mean we <clears throat> chose our partners I think carefully, right? We wanted somebody that could help us with the European market, and so we were looking mainly for VC uh, in Europe. Um, which was confusing to everybody involved, that two people that you know, had, had co-founded GitHub, which is this big thing, and raised our Series A for GitHub, because it was bootstrapped for a long time, was $100 million. Which yeah. is, and so you know, we're going around and, and we're like, no, we're really only talking to people in Europe, which, which confused everybody, I think. But, but we found Fly, um, which are you know, young guys from, from tech and like, understand the mentality of what we're trying to do. Um, and have been fantastic partners uh, for us. And so I think we've been, we've been really happy that, that that's the path that we went down. But, but did you need the venture capital to begin with? Because, okay, you just sold GitHub. You've got plenty of money. Do you, did you, why bother getting the venture capital if you can afford it yourself? Yeah. I think it's about finding partners you want to work with. The same as you hire employees you can essentially hire a VC firm to help you enter new markets, especially for us here. You know, we're not from Germany. We don't understand Europe the way that Europeans do. And so with Fly, they helped us get a lot of knowledge. They helped us find our office, you know, our, our general manager for our, our German office. They helped us find other employees. They've just been really great at being on the ground, sort of tactical knowledge of this okay. market. I think it's fascinating that you guys chose Berlin because there are lots of cities around the world where you have lots of expats who would work for a lot cheaper than they would in San Francisco. Yeah. Um, would you have chosen Berlin if Brexit had not happened? Yeah, certainly. I mean, I, I think Berlin is one of the, I mean, I, most of the people that I knew that were Americans or Australians that were living in Europe were living in Berlin because Berlin's cool, right? There's, it's, it's a very, very cool, hip city. Um, I think it has, of the startup scenes in, in Europe, it's probably one of, it, it's the best or one of the best startup scenes in Europe, um, partially because it's, it's less expensive and so like a lot of companies are starting up there, but it means that there's a lot of people that are familiar with how startups run. I mean, we do have this American mindset for startups and so we do want to find people that know what that means, right, to, to some degree, that are familiar with, with, with what it means to work for an American style startup, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, so I think it's been, worked out very well, but I think the coolness of, of Berlin on top of, of the startup mentality makes it a great place to, to, to begin. Yeah, I'd say Berlin to me feels a little bit like San Francisco did 10 years ago in a way that things are still really fresh. Like it feels like the beginning of something really amazing. In San Francisco, it's, it's so saturated with technology. It's causing the city to, to like, almost enter a civil war of, you know, wealth, uh, like the disparity in wealth is, is so vast, like it's, it's become a different place. And, but, and Berlin but, to me is like, it's right on the dawn of this amazing sort of renaissance of what could be a, a huge startup. Well, let me, let me kind of play devil's advocate a little bit, because I, I remember being in Silicon Valley, being in San Francisco even 20 years ago and hearing people say the, the very same thing about Silicon Valley that you're saying about Berlin. And now we say that Silicon Valley is almost a victim of its own success, and it's it priced people out of the market. Yeah. Um, do you feel like that you're contributing maybe to the same development in Berlin, that maybe in 15 years the German capital will also be too expensive and untouchable? It's hard to say. I think every, every experience for every city is going to be different. But I think if you can find great people and you can work with those great people, then who knows what can happen. And I think it's, if the city pays attention to what's happening, part of the problem in San Francisco is, is just how the city handles it, right? So I think if city governments can pay attention and really see what's happening and take advantage of that, 
things can go however you want them to go. Okay, well, give me an example. Uh, uh, what do you see in Berlin that you wish you could find in San Francisco? I think there's, a, there's more art, right? I, yeah. I think very specifically for our use case, we are looking for curriculum developers and we're looking for people that aren't engineers um, and, and designers. And the cost of living in the Bay Area is so high that it drives out a lot of creative types, like a lot of, a lot of people that aren't engineers that, that, that can't pull down $200,000 salaries or, or something at, at Facebook. Um, and so it's much, much harder to find creative types that, or, or curriculum developers or you know, other types than engineers and, and designers. And that, those roles are much more important, I think, for what our mission is now um, than, than a lot of other companies. And, yeah. and in the Bay Area, even if we hired somebody and paid high salaries, they would be constantly being poached by other companies. There's just all of these tech companies right. in the area. Um, and here, it's not that that doesn't happen. It's that, it's that you know, the, the city is not as, as competitive. It's not as tech-driven 100%. And, and I think that it makes it a much more fun place to work. Like, I, I really enjoy coming here and hanging out with the, the crew in Berlin. Um, and, uh, you know. Do you, ever, do you ever feel like a fish out of water in Berlin? Um, Berlin has a reputation of having a lot of people. Uh, how many people in the audience live in Berlin? All right, so there's some. I mean, you know, a lot of, you run into a lot of people in Berlin who say that they are Lebenskunstler, right? Which means that, like, you know, they're, they're artists yeah. for life, and, yeah. which means basically they don't work. And, um, and, and right, right. I mean, I'm not, I'm not giving a value judgment on that. I mean, but that's usually what it means, right? And it, a lot of people say that the the what what you would find maybe in the U.S. this this drive and ambition is the one thing that maybe is missing in Berlin. I'm not sure though. If you're if you're if you're that, if you're an artist for life, that means that you're doing what you love regardless of financial benefit. And I think the best startup founders are exactly that. They build something because they have to, not because they think that someday they're going to get some huge payout. I, yeah. don't think that's why, I don't think that's where great startups come from. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to start calling myself a Lebenskunstler now. You get, yes. Um. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I haven't met many Lebenskunstler who were billionaires, <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, you could start your own club, I guess. Um, so how, how often are you guys in Berlin? Because well, I'm you here, split your time, right? Yeah, I'm here about a week, a month um, now. So I have a, a room uh, in a Wohngemeinschaft in, in Berlin. And so I can just go there and, and keep my stuff there and, uh, and come back and forth between my family in the Bay Area um, and working with, with the rest of the co-founders in the Bay Area. And then now, almost the, the entire rest of the company is in Berlin. And the, the whole concept of, of Chatterbug, being able to learn different languages, um, what is the impact of artificial intelligence yeah. going to be on, on, the, on the concept that you guys have for this company? I think it's, uh, you know, AI I think is going to change a lot of industries. But one thing that's really unique about human communication is the richness of it. Like you might have a machine that can automatically translate something, but are you going to understand the humor that is involved in it? Are you going to understand where that person is coming from that, that wrote the original text or said the original words? At the end of the day, we're humans and we crave communication. And communication is this, mm -hmm. right? Communication isn't me talking into my phone and then that phone talking into your ear. It's not the same. I don't think it will ever be the same. And, and honestly, I've also been, I think there's some simultaneous translators over here. I've had, I've had uh, translators traveling through, through Japan and stuff. And it's great, but it's not the same as speaking Japanese, right? It's not the same as being able to have conversations. Um, we had a party at the Chatterbug offices last night, had a lot of customers come over and, and teachers and, and had a, a good time talking to everybody. And I went back and forth between German and English with different people at the party. And you can't, it does like if I had that in an app, it's a very different thing. Like you want to make human connection, which is the point of language, right? It's about culture. Like there's, there's communication and there's culture. Those are the two interesting, that, that's, those are the components of language. And you can get communication with technology, and I don't think you can get culture with technology. If um, artificial intelligence, if AI allows us to get to the point where we, I don't know, maybe we have an app or we even get a chip implanted in us that allows us to have instantaneous interpreting yeah. of any language that we, that we hear, that would kind of put you guys out of business, right? Well, so, no, in that 
Well, there's a couple different things. One is, I don't want to say we're not interested in AI or ML or, or these things. I think that they can vastly help with the teaching process, with the education process, with the learning process. And so we are already using some machine learning, some, some I mean, very basic stuff to try to figure out, for example, with flashcards, what words should you see next, right? Or, or um, what is the best way for you personally to learn as opposed to sort of in a group class where everybody moves at the same pace, right? We can personalize everything. And so I think, uh, technology will help us hyper-personalize your language learning to, to you specifically. But as far as will we not need to learn a language anymore after our first one because of technology, um, I think there's a, a, a lot of hard problems. And, and I think at some point we'll get to the point where you can put something on and it's like having an in-person translator. But they'll use, you know, when you have a conversation with people, they use phrases that are untranslatable or don't make any sense if you haven't seen, you know, a TV show in Germany 20 years ago right. and, and you're making a cultural reference to it or something like that. And that happened all the time, just remembering walking around with a translator in Japan, right? Like, even if you understand what's happening, and even if you can get some weird voice in a chip to come out of your ear, which is, and, and the other person doesn't think that's awkward, I think you're not going to get married having a Google phone in your ear, right? Like, you're not going to fall in love well, uh, if, if you don't, you know, I mean, maybe. Maybe, well, you I, never yeah, know, I yeah. Know, but, but, but I think having that, that the, the cultural communication is, is harder than, than what technology will be able to do. Yeah. You know? People that speak a native language to each other or can speak at a native level to each other, they'll get things done better, right? In a business perspective, right. for instance, you're going to have better rapport with someone that you can speak their language right. than you will speaking through a translation. I think there will, there will be advantages to knowing multiple languages for a very long time. And, and to be honest, I think that that cultural communication is, is and, and exchange is one of the most important things about why I'm passionate about this and why I'm doing this. Because in learning German, I've learned a lot about German culture. I've learned a lot about German philosophies and, and personalities and, and how communication happens in, in German culture. And it has changed my understanding of, of people to some degree. Of, Can you of give me German. an example of when, you, when of, you're, when you're so trying my to... Favorite, my favorite one is, is you know, saying Americans are very polite in greetings and very, very superficial. Um, how are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Even like you could have just gotten your kneecap broken and you'd be like, how are you doing? Good. Like it's just a thing. It's a ritual that you do. Um, and in Germany, a lot of times that's, that's uh, you know, uh, it's not that, right? You can, you can go up to somebody on the street and say, how are you doing? And they're like, well, let me tell you how I'm doing and go into yeah. a long story. And I've started doing that in, in America as well. Um, and I find it, A, very funny. Um, in America, but also really interesting. Like I like hearing people's stories, and and so when I I like when I ask how are you doing, I hear how people are doing, um, and so I, f I find that interesting. It's it's interesting to to understand more about your own culture by seeing it through the lens of. And America. when you when Americans ask you how are you doing, and you give them a real answer, do you think they want to hear it? Uh, no, you can immediately see if they want to hear it and are surprised by it, or if they're like, shit, um, I. This is not what I signed up for. I just wanted to you know, just keep it going. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's amusing. My favorite yep. is the way that Germans can really insult each other so creatively. My favorite, for instance, is it to, to, if you want to say someone's weak, you can say, they're a Hanshu Schneeballwerfer, <laughs> which yeah. for English speakers out there, I mean, that means you use a glove when you throw a snowball you can't throw with your bare hands. No. That would cause you too much pain. No. And it's just, uh, and that's just one, you know, make it one word, you know? Uh, oh, you <laughs> Why mean not? a, a, a right? yeah. Schneeballwerfer? Yeah, so, I just, it's just, it's the best. <laughs> I love it. It's, okay. I've, I've never heard that. Yeah. that. Have you guys heard that before? <laughs> I think you've just. I just taught you I a think new you one. Guys just see, <laughs> you that, and that is the beauty Try of your company. Try to use that today in casual conversation. <laughs> uh, but but, but yeah, you, I mean, it is an important thing. I think for the world. I mean, we all you know follow the news, obviously, yeah. and and I think, or you know, if you're on Twitter, I think you your view of the world is quite dim a lot of times because everybody's angry on Twitter all the time. But <laughs> but. What I really like about learning another language and learning another culture is, is that the human connection that, that that provides, I think, provides empathy for people that are not like yourself. And yep. I think that that's increasingly important, specifically for America, in, in my view, but, but probably for the rest of the world as well, right? Of, of, of having this, this angst of people that are not like you. I think learning about somebody that is not exactly like you 
um, and seeing, trying to see the world through their culture and their eyes helps provide empathy that is valuable to, to the world. That's, that's why mainly that I want Chatterbug to succeed, not to make more money. Well, I mean, do you want to sell it one day like you did with GitHub? I want it to be, I want it to have an, as many people learn a new language and a new culture as possible. And so whatever makes that happen is, is what I want to see. So do you want to sell it one day? Uh, I would if I thought it would make it more powerful. But that is not what I'm interested in. I, I'm interested in making, it, in making it big. And Tom? Yeah, I mean, just I, the money. He wants I'm the money. only in it now. I, I, I agree. You know, I, I, got into compu I got into programming because I originally wanted to study physics, and I realized that physics is just math. I don't love math that much. I love creating things that are useful for people. And so programming is a way that you can make something useful every day. Your impact is immediately perceivable in how you can help someone do something. Yeah. And so for me, Chatterbug really is this amazing platform. And the way that we do it is that we provide all the curriculum on Chatterbug, and then we can have tutors that are not experts at teaching a language become really effective language tutors by using Chatterbug. This is a way that we can bring a way to make real money to anyone in the world that has one skill, the skill to speak their native language, which is something that they have practiced for thousands of hours, but is not very well marketable if you don't have a way to be supported in doing it. And so for me, and the reason that I joined Chatterbug when Scott brought it up to me and sort of pitched me on the idea was, this is a way that we can bring jobs to potentially millions of people in the world, wherever they happen to be, by making them effective language tutors. I mean, that, I think that's, that's a, a great cause. Um, do you see these jobs, and we're running out of time here, do you see these jobs uh, as jobs that, that can, with time can grow, and also in terms of income for these people, or, or will these always be, you know, low-income jobs. I would love for them to be jobs that can support their entire lifestyle, right? So that a this living is a legitimate wage. Job. Yeah. People oh, yeah. pay real money to learn a language, and we can pass that on to our language tutors and still have the margins that we need to run the business. Okay. I would absolutely love to see people using Chatterbug full-time to make their living. Okay. And would you guys, um, last question because we're out of time, would you guys, since now you're in Berlin and you're part of the startup scene, would you consider yourself to be Berlin hipsters? <laughs> I don't dress cool enough to be I'm a I'm not Berlin even a hipster. San Francisco hipster. I okay. don't know. Yeah. I don't All know. right. Well, <laughs> you guys are very wealthy, whatever you are. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you for sharing you. your story thank with you. us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. It was nice meeting you. Thank you again. Nice meeting you. Thank you. Thank you.